thank you everyone for joining us today. I want to appreciate all the viewers in the past few weeks that we've been doing these seminars, uh, transforming the alternative investment ecosystem through technology. Thank you for joining us. During these webinars, our speakers will go into detail, illustrating how to streamline and automate your business for alternative investments, where technology is transforming the alternative investment universe for financial advisors, broker dealers, RAs, sponsors, and investors. We wanna give you an opportunity to hear from emerging leaders in the FinTech world to better understand how they are impacting the alternative asset space. As far as a little housekeeping today, here's our disclaimer that I have to read. New View Trust serves as your custodian for alternative investments. New View does not provide tax, legal, or investment advice, nor do we sell investments. We custody IRAs, ESAs, HSAs, and 401ks that hold alternative investments chosen by the client. Today, our speaker is Brad West from AIX. AIX is a digital platform built to improve the process for investing in alternatives and enable growth for our industry. Brad West is the COO at AIX with 20 plus years of experience and leading within that 20 years in managing business products, lines and teams in different industries and functions, including financial services, healthcare benefits, e-learning and commercial technology services. So he comes to, to us with a lot of tenure, a lot of experience, and he's a great guy. And so, so happy to ha have you with us today, Brad. Uh, Heath, it's a pleasure. I, I really uh, look forward to the conversation and uh, have a lot of respect for, for your firm and, and what you guys are doing with this platform to provide education to the broader market. So thank you. No, oh, it, it's our pleasure. We, we just really appreciate participating. Um, you know, you will close our webinar series and I can't think of another another company you know with the with the presence and the platform that you have to be able to do that for us and we've appreciated your partnership and that partnership continues to grow and we appreciate you making it easier for our investors to participate in alts and so we have a series of questions we're going to go through and some of these questions are ones that you and i've discussed in the past there are also some questions that have come up in our previous um, webinars that i thought were relevant and so i just you know appreciate this conversation but First and foremost, just tell us about AIX. Tell us about the inception, the history, and a little bit about you guys. Thank you. Uh, so our, you know, our backstory is somewhat unique in, in that we came actually, we're incubated within an alternative investment sponsor. So around 2016, um, we were inside an alternative investment sponsor, was raising capital in the retail channel, uh, coming off of a year where um, we had about 84,000 subscriptions that were supporting about three and a half billion in flow. Um, and so that's a, a lot of paper, uh, a lot of NIGOs and a lot of challenges. And you know, at that time, the forward looking view is when you looked at the regulatory nature of what was going to what was going to come into market uh, from FINRA and the SEC with a lot of pressure uh, to you know, provide transparency regarding fees. Um, and then you, know, you flash forward with, with Reg BI, you know, the thesis was that you were going to see a shift in the way the money flowed from you know, brokerage commission business moving more into advisory. And then I think, um, you know, from a wealth manager and advisor perspective, you might deal with uh, or tolerate a lot of the administrative inefficiencies um, in a brokerage commission world. But if it starts to move into an advisory basis, there's just too much opportunity cost. It might take an advisor, you know, six years uh, on a compensation level to make what they, they would historically make in brokerage commission. And there's just, you know, this industry has been mired with you know, lots of paper, a lot of manual processes, a, a lot of, you know, kind of frictional points, you know, and the thesis was that if, you know, this, you know, call it asset class, particularly in the retail channel, um, if the administrative issues aren't addressed, it's just going to become a, a, a rate limiter to the ability to, you know, grow and raise assets. Um, and so our overall thesis was, you know, let's try to take an industry stewardship perspective and, you know, I like the, the term ecosystem because it really is about how do you connect all of these different, um, in some ways, disparate and secular parties. There's the custodial relationships and the fund admins and the TAs, and you have the product sponsors and you have the wealth managers. Um, how does everything get connected together? Um, and our intention, frankly, was never to go build a company. It wasn't to go build technology. It was to go solve a problem. And as we spent, um, you know, time in the market, trying to see you know, who could we partner with and how could we you know, really address these issues. Our consensus was that um, the other players who were in the market were really focused on you know, other lines of business and solving different types of problems. 
Um, and a lot of what we really identified, you know, which is really you know germane to this discussion and our relationship was that in order to really create an impact and really address the issues, it has to be a front to back experience. And that really begins with how do you work with custodial parties? How do you work with fund admins? How do you work with transfer agencies? How can you create connectivity front to back? And what we were seeing was kind of missing was that there was a lot of orientation on the front, you know, which is how do I fill out a PDF document? How do I get something electronically signed, which you know is important, but unless that information was really moving, you know, through home office and supervision review processes and getting connectivity, you know, to your custodial party or to the TA, um, you had a lot of whiplash that was still finding its way back to the advisor in, in the end wasn't making you know an overall better experience so what we really wanted to do is build technology that would be able to be agnostic connect the broader ecosystem work particularly with an emphasis with custodial relationships the intermediaries and then complement that with the great front end and we feel like that was really was going to move the needle but that's kind of our our kind of backstory that's great yeah that, that summarizes it really well i think the two primary themes that that we talk about internally at New View and I and the discussions I have with the new opportunities and, and relationships or and you mentioned it a second ago or how do we manage and limit NIGOs so not in good order if there's anything that can slow up our process and slow up the process for sponsors and um, financial advisors and investors it's certainly that and the other is advisors specifically they they want to limit how many times they have to go back to their investor and and because because really the onus is on them it comes back to them and they you know they, they kind of put us into the fold of that and making sure that experience is as streamlined as possible what are a couple of the biggest inefficiencies and challenges that aix sees and what are the what are the capabilities that you have that'll address those it's, it's a great point i think a lot of this guys back and it's it's interesting because even as you talk about um, you know, those experiences that you, you have relative to the advisor and the client. I think part of the overall, you know, thesis here is that everyone's brand is on the line. So, you know, if someone's dealing with, um, you know, a, a, a transaction and you're providing a custodial service, if that's not a great experience, fairly or unfairly, there's still, like, I think of it as graffiti. It's still tarnishing the brand because someone goes, well, that wasn't great. Who is involved in that experience? And the same, you know, so that applies from, the advisor and how they manage that relationship with the client. You want to go back and ask the same question twice or refill paperwork. Um, you guys want to make it easier you know, to do business. And frankly, even if we think about those product sponsor relationships, if someone's trying to write business into their products, if it's not a great you know, subscription experience, it still kind of creates that tarnish. Um, and so I think what we want to be able to do is we look at technology as a way that can actually elevate everyone's brand so it's not just trying to remove frictional points but you can create an experience that is actually you know markedly better than what people have had before and the way we approach that um is we think about there's got to be all the right checks and balances on the front with you know the the rules and it has to be responsive you've got to be able to guide advisors investors to know that they're really answering all the questions completely that there's not going to be something that's otherwise identified in the back end you know by say your firm that says, hey, you missed this checkbox, or you have to answer this question, or since this is a trust, you've got to supply trust documentation and on. It's all those little details um, that if you don't address them on the front, they get caught in the back. If they're caught in the back, now you're asking people to do you know, work again. So I think the things where we've really invested heavily have been a, a real orientation to create you know, a, a rules engine that's proprietary on the front that prevents the issue before it comes an issue. I think the second kind of tier of that is you need to have dynamic workflow. So if you look at who's in this transaction, the next kind of question is, well, who needs what and where does it need to go? Um, yeah. So you have the sub docs, you have the custodial forms, you may have the other things that we say come along for the ride, uh, government issued IDs, articles and corporation, trust documents. It depends how people answer the questions on the front. That determines what we call that trade package of all the other stuff you got to collect. And then the question becomes, once you've figured out, um, you know, the, the workflow, who needs to provide oversight and approve it what sequence and order is, what's the best way to get it to them? Um, and then we think of that as you know, the interoperability of how do I get this semblance of, uh, of data and documents and get this in the most efficient way for someone else to do business? And, and that gets into, we think about data connectivity, how can we take that trade package 
and get it to you for processing, get it to the TA or the fund admin for processing if someone's insourcing and doing themselves. And that includes AML KYC. So in the end, our view is if you've got really robust rules on the front, you can dynamically configure the workflow that supports how everybody wants to do business from a supervision and compliance perspective. And you can get data and connect that on the back and deliver it in such a way where you're actually automating the way other people can process that work. We, you know, and part of the way we've really focused uh, is to build data, data connectivity where we can populate people's systems um, without any rekeying. And what we can start to see in, in the overall thesis and experience is it starts to feel like a mutual fund because now you're going from an advisor to a client to a supervision off to a custodial party TA and have it be purely data and now you can start to see those cycle times go from weeks and we've seen some of them go to 48 hours and we would expect the as you mentioned with the not in good orders um you know there are particular custodians out in the market who are not you um that if you look at non-traded they might have a 60 percent not in good order rate um you think that any other commercial experience you have in your life if you try to buy something six out of ten times it would come back rejected like it does i can't think of any other you know, type of experience uh, that, that you know, you, you encounter that type of, uh, of, of error rate. So our objective here is you want to see that you get to, you know, sub 5%, closer to 2% um, and make it very easy for everybody in this transaction to do business. So it's really about the rules, the workflow and the data connectivity in the back and then speaking everyone's language. So you're supporting everyone's view of their legal, their compliance interpretations, their operating you know, processes of how do they natively and naturally do business. And then from a tech perspective, meet people where they are. What's the, you know, what's the best way for us to give you this information so it's easy for you to process it and the technology that you, you live in every day? So when I was looking away, I was writing, writing some of the, the notes that you just, um, notes on what you just said. And because uh, I'm going to steal it. Uh, but as far as some of them. So as far as everyone, everyone's brand is on the line and we're, we're here as well as you as we partner to elevate everyone's brand, uh, to make sure that, that it's, a it's a dynamic workflow. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's important. We're, we're constantly talking internally here, you know, day, if not daily, weekly, about how we can make sure that we, and again, you said it the best, um, and that's why I'm gonna use it over and over again, but how can we make sure that we're respectful and that we help elevate the, the, you know, the brands that we're working with and companies like your, you and companies like yours has helped to, helped us do that. Um, so that was great. Yeah, you know, thank you. How would you? How do you think you guys compare? Or, or what would you say is a good comparison between you and other fintech companies in your arena? It's a great question. It's one we get you know all, all the time. And I think there's you know to me I started kind of develop a rubric for how people think about it because there's there's a lot of you know tech companies. There's you know marketing messages sound same to similar. And sometimes it's difficult to navigate that. Um, one way I think about it is, you know, you look at it from a commercial lens, you look to see, well, what businesses are these FinTech companies in and how do people get paid? So for instance, you know, we are a technology only company. That's it. We did, we're just a tech company. If you compare other called FinTech companies or FinTech companies and alts, um, they, many of them, most of them are in other called lines of business. So they might provide diligence services. They might provide education services. They might be promising distribution. Um, they are most uh, of them are regulated entities. Um, and many of them also provide managing broker dealer services. And they might be doing you know, the, the fund administration. So what we start to see is, in, you know, those become you know, other sources of, of revenue and lines of business where they're providing um, you know, lots of things, education, diligence, um, you know, you know, promising wholesaling distribution and on lots of stuff. And our, our challenge in viewing that was that we've been very intentional to say, hey, let, let's just be the tech company. Let's not be those other things. And part of that is when we think about connecting the ecosystem, there's an element of wanting commercial neutrality. So when you're serving a client that your clients effectively choosing, you know, their partner topology, they're choosing how they want to sell, you know, their wholesaling group, they're, fig they're determining how they want to support diligence, how they want to support education. Um, they may have their own MBD. They may work with another managing broker dealer and they don't want that conflict to know, hey, if I work with you and I put my stuff on your platform and you're also a managing broker dealer, you know, do I have to worry about commercial conflict here? And um, so our kind of view is that let's do be narrowly defined, but let's go really, really deep 
So let's go to the dark places and alternative investments because it's incredibly nuanced and solve for all those things that make it really sticky and create those frictional points and make it easy to business. And it's the only way we get paid. So part of it is, I think that other FinTech players are in other lines of business. They do other things. We just say, we're gonna be the tech company. That's all we're gonna do. And we're gonna be great at it. Um, second you know, part of that, which ties in the commercial stuff is the pricing. It's really important to understand um, not only how people get paid, but how much they get paid. Uh, we've been very intentional that we want to create a high value quotient. So when you look at the, you know, the, the, the pay and fee for technology, it's got to make sense to the fund sponsor uh, because effectively it's a fun admin expense. I think we look around the market, there's some other stuff that's pretty rich in, in the fee schedule. So you might see $50,000 on board a product. You might be looking 25, 35 basis points on a recurring basis. That's, those are really, really rich fees. It's a very heavy tax for a fund to pay. And ultimately, you know, that's borne by the investor. You know, so that's coming out of the investor performance. So what we see in, in those challenges is that creates a friction point for fund sponsors uh, because they know that's coming out of the performance of their fund. Um, and we've also seen uh, on the advisor side, some of those fees are so heavy by the other FinTech companies um, that certain advisors are actually waiving their fee because they don't want the investor to have to bear all the fees that are layered into the transaction. So we've been you know, very mindful to provide high value, uh, but also to make sure that pricing makes a lot of sense so, you know, for everybody involved in the transaction. And then it's just really just you know, going to you know, the dark places uh, with alt so that you, you have, there's a big difference between a great sales presentation versus did you really impact someone's business? And I think it's, it's really all the details and our commitment as a firm has been not only have a nice sales presentation, a lot of people have nice sales presentations, but when, as, when you turn the lights on, did you authentically create a better experience for everybody involved? You know, was it really truthfully a better experience for the advisor? Did you, you know, create a level of efficiency? Was it good for the client? Did you help people grow their business? Did you help them, you know, help people uh, raise capital? Did you really enforce the regulatory and compliance guidelines and, and support the de-risking? And so it's been a really commitment to just be a tech company, do it well, create efficiency, deliver the promise, and provide a high level uh, a value quotient, and just not be in other lines of business. And I think that's really kind of who we are. That's our DNA. You mentioned something too on the fees. We, we've had a discounted fee schedule for our financial advisors for a number of years now, um, relative, relative to what you were mentioned before, is paying attention to how their fee structure, how their fee structure yeah. looks. Yeah. And how they're they're how they're compensated, so we could make sure that we could work. So we were a good business partner in that way, because ultimately, yeah. that that the investor is going to pay for that, right? And, and understand and understanding our financial advisor's business model, and understanding um, how they how they have to monetize their their services and their process. Um, so so important. Other thing you mentioned too, it's it's interesting how you guys have double down and super focused and, and all your resources are going to making sure your, your technology and your platform as is is as streamlined resourceful as it can be because we're seeing right how alternatives are so broadly defined now which is exciting yeah. you know yeah. you've got mutual funds and etfs which are there's you have um there's there's so many mergers out there right now and 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 right. really the, they're in a different direction we're expanding on this side, which is pretty exciting. That's one of the reasons why I love, I was a mutual fund wholesaler for 20 years. And one of the reasons why I love that now I'm, I'm on this side of the, on this side of the uh, block now is that I feel like there's right. Every conference we go to, there's more and more and more folks. So with mm -hmm. that said, if you look at your, your business, who are the, who, what kind, what type of sponsors do you guys work with? Is it, is it just REITs or is it, is it broader than that? I mean, give us That's a great that. question. In the way we would kind of define the the alternative universe structurally, and and I can't, I'm not smart enough to be able to you know cite them chapter and verse. But we would say there's there's 17 alt structures in the universe. And so when we work with sponsors, we're supporting every type of alternate investment structure. You know, so that is from hedge fund to private placement to you know REITs to BDCs to 1031s to opportunity zones. Um, to non-traded preferreds, you know, it is the entire gauntlet. And, you know, our, our part of that goes back to the mandate of, hey, we just want to take the role as a tech company. Could you be the, you know, metaphorical, you know, Intel inside? It just makes it easier for people to do business. 
and do it in a commercially neutral way where you can work with any sponsor, support any structure, um, work with whoever the designated fund MTA party is, help them connect into you know, their distribution channels and just easier for everyone to do business. But part of that, you know, to deliver that mandate means we don't want a sponsor to be rate limited uh, in terms of what type of product they can take to market, which effectively means we've got to be really good at every type of structure they take to market. So, and I think that, you know, sometimes there's, a, I think there's the expression, you know, what's old again is new again. Um, so you could see trend lines from, you know, six, seven years ago, you know, BDCs were, were really hot. And then I think that kind of shifted to, you know, you start to see other, you know, other structures started to emerge or reemerge. Now you start to see more BDCs coming back into the market. So I think the structures that come into the market from a sponsor perspective, you know, those are going to, those are going to evolve o- over time. Um, and each sponsor is looking to create a level of differentiation for themselves and their story. And what we, what we want to provide, I think what the industry needs is a technology platform who can really support any type of structure that sponsor chooses to take to the market and make sure no matter what that structure is, um, that it's going to work really, really well and create a, a high level experience, you know, for the advisors and where they want to distribute and, and raise capital. Um, so the short answer is we really work with, you know, any type of structure in the market. We are supporting the entire array of uh, the types of investors, which from mass affluent to, to accredited, to QP, to QC, to an institutional. Again, it kind of goes back to our agnostic mandate, which is we want to be able to support you know, and allow people to do business wherever they want to do business and make sure wherever they do business, it's done really, really well. And it's a good experience for, for everybody involved. Uh, but our, our wheelhouse is probably what I'd call that independent channel. Uh, with with regard to you know the independent broker dealers and the RA community, in addition to certain sponsors are looking to raise that you know capital and a direct investor model, and we're supporting that as well. Specifically in the RAs, we're seeing a migration. Well, you and I through the years, right? We've seen the migration as far as financial advisors go from the wirehouses to the independent broker dealers or the banks. Then they eventually they go they want autonomy, so now mm-hmm. they're they're going RA. We're noticing, I'm noticing, we're noticing kind of a, I'm going to call it the reverse migration where the autonomy has been great. They're like, oh my goodness, now I've got a, my business, like I've now got to build out my business model. Who's going to do my IT? Who's going to provide, you know, an extra layer of due diligence for my portfolio construction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So where I'm seeing kind of a reverse migration into what I'm, I've kind of coined this, who knows if it's accurate. I'm going to call them, you know, the RIA co-ops, where you have the alternatives, Mm -hmm. the bell points, the beacon points, right, that are acting as the hub for these smaller RIA practices. And Mm -hmm. that's pretty cool, right? And I would imagine you guys are are working with those folks because it's a bigger footprint, better for us, better for you. With all that said, how does your technology integrate with one of those bigger RAA co-ops, I'm going to call it, or maybe an individual RAA practice, if they have established technology already, how do you guys integrate and can you integrate? It's a great question. And so we, we end up you know, kind of creating different models or called levels of integration. And um, I, I love plagiarizing you know, because it's easier to see someone else's good idea. Go, I like that. So you know, part of the construct is we think it was almost like plus models. So you can have Hulu, you can have Hulu Plus, And I think their latest, uh, you know, commercials, they call it Hulu plus, plus, plus. Um, so you get levels of integration. But part of the idea is, you know, is that we provide a base model. When we think about an independent RIA who um, maybe they're not looking for deep levels of integration, but what they want is they want to get access to alternative investment product um, in a controlled way, is that in, in, in a highly digital way, is we can provide one model that allows any RA to come to us. And for all the sponsor partners that are on, on our network, um, while supporting their signing agreement rules, because we don't create like an open marketplace where everyone sees everything. It's always, you know, codified, controlled by the signing agreement practices. Um, we can make those products available for those RIAs. And in those cases, um, they can come in, they can do business with us. And as they um, have their investor and account information, you know, that information persists. So the next time they want to do another trade with another sponsor, another structure, that information is automatically pre-filling, you know, all those, all those forms um, supporting the sub documents, custodial forms, uh, and also enforcing the uh, the e signature you know, policies and processes as well. And so we kind of do that. It very you know opens it up. So really, any RA has the ability to, to transact and do and do business with us that way. And then you get into 
at the other end of the continuum, there's there's things in between. What we have are these really rich, you know, fulsome enterprise um, opportunities. We'll work with an with a, a wealth manager, and they'll say, "Look, I want my brand identity because as you as you talked about, he is, is spot on. Is you know the role that the wealth management firms are playing. It's they're providing technology. You know, they're providing you know compliance, um, you know, services, and they may uh, and the IBD side." they're providing their view and their stamp on the diligence in, in, of these products, what they think are good products. And so when what we look at is say in, in those models, um, we want to elevate their brand. So we create, you know, the white labeled portals of those those wealth management firms. So it's their brand identity. Um, we're incorporating their proprietary forms into those workflows. So it's not just sub docs and custodial forms, but it's the proprietary forms of that wealth manager that they need to a company that, you know, in, in that transaction. And then there's the full data integration where we, we can pull in, we have APIs into, uh, you know, into, you know, Salesforce and CRM platforms. So that account information, investor information is automatically pre-filling these forms. Um, and then we're also incorporating their supervision and compliance workflows. And then we find is, you know, typically no two are the same. So do you require principal review? Do you not require, do you have operating review before it goes to principals? Do you, you know, are you looking for pre-trade approval before it goes to a client to evaluate a product? Or do you want everything bundled up and then you want it to go to supervision and compliance? We're configuring all those workflows to be native to how do those wealth management firms want to do business? And I think the key construct in all this is that if you want to really get a, a deeply fulsome experience, what you can find in those models is that they got your brand identity, all their data, you know, coming in from uh, CRMs will automatically pre-fill the forms, their proprietary forms, you know, their curated list of the products that they approve and want to make available, you know, to their advisor and rep communities, um, you know, with the custodial relationships, with their forms, signature policies, supervision, compliance processes, and then clicking a button and having that trade package of information automatically transmit wherever it's supposed to go as an intermediary. And, and what that does in that enterprise models, it, it creates an end-to-end -end experience. It starts to feel like a mutual fund where we would expect, you know, that all those documents are completed in less than 10 minutes by a rep. You're looking at same-day approval processes from home offices or principals where those are required. And then you're looking at automatically transmitting off to the intermediary relationship for processing. And then you want to see, you know, in good order rates that are, you know, north of, of 95%. Um, and so that's if you want to go really deep and commit and then others to say, hey, if I just want to be able to, on the other end, lower integration, get access to all these products where I can do digital subscription because I can't find that, you know, these products in another platform. But if I can fill that out and have my data be there the next time around and I can know that the signature policies that I'm enacting are going to be supported by wherever it needs to go and it's going to be in good order 95 percent of the time, like I'll take that deal all day long. And so we, that's, we kind of look at, you know, you want to go low and get high impact. We can do that. You want to go deep and have deep you know, integration and connectivity. We can do that. And we basically flex that to say, based on what we're working with, you know, how do you want to do business? And we can kind of do anything in between. Yeah. Cause ultimately let's just go take it back to RAAs. They're just building out their business yeah. model. They want everything yeah. to be as efficient. They want to aggregate, they want to consolidate and they want to be able to build. So working with, I know the new view working with you and your platform, yep. and also we're, we're actually investing a lot into um, our, our portal that we already exist, but next year we're going to be launching a new one, which again, we're investing a lot of resources and time into it to make it more efficient for our users. Mm -hmm. um, it's all in the effort of making sure that we can provide the most consolidated experience for our business partners. Uh, now I'm going to go into a couple of questions that we've had from other sessions from viewers that I think are super relevant. And then we'll a uh, couple of those and then we'll, we'll close out with, um, I have a question for you as far as uh, something that, you know, things that you're seeing on the road. Uh, so in, in a regulatory environment that has seen more focus on the middle markets by the SEC and FINRA, how do you see technology, namely your particular platform as a solution? So I, I think there's a couple of yeah, pieces that I think part of it is when we think about you know, Reg BI is being, you know, one, one big part, um, you know, what we're able to do is in, incorporate and enforce the, you know, practices of the wealth manager that, you know, in terms of suitability, the questions they're asking, 
um, and incorporating that into the transactional process. So it's a, a natural part as you're building out the sub doc, the custodial forms, your your you know your investing experience. If there are proprietary practices of the wealth manager that they are incorporating uh, to ensure that they are compliant with Reg BI on the front, and there's also the defensibility if you're ever asked by a, a regular a regulatory body to say, hey, show me what you're doing and prove to me that you actually executed these practices, um, that those things are built into the process. And then it's also creating automated trade blotters and the date timestamp of approval of every single event that happened over the course of a transaction. And that all becomes available at the push of a button. Um, and so you're kind of naturally building in, you know, the enforcement and compliance, you know, policies of, of the parties that we work with. So it's a natural part of the process. And then it's also making it very easy. I think of it as like an electronic remittance that someone says, hey, how do I know that you, you know, actually did what you say that you did? Then it's as simple as you push a button, and then you have all those logs there from a compliance perspective. And in contrast, what you see um, today is a lot of you know groups they got partial information. There's stuff in spreadsheets. There's scattered paper archives everywhere. So if you're ever getting that call from Fenra or the SEC and they want to know, hey, show me what you did, you know that creates stress. And the nice thing in the way this is kind of developed is that um, that's literally just clicking a button, and you can self-provision and pull that information. The, the second of the two buckets is really tied back to cybersecurity. So. You know, we think about that protection of that data, that PII, that NPI, that, you know, that, that SSNs and bank account information. Um, you need to make sure that's secure. And so that means you got to have the right technology to support that. So one of the things that, you know, we, we are as a SOC 2 type 2 certified firm, I would say any, anyone who's looking in the market, you want to make sure that you're getting a SOC 2 type 2, you know, certified provider. Um, you know, so you're going to need that even back to vendor diligence practices from FINRA and SEC, and if you pick a tech partner, they're going to go, well, how do I know that you enacted the right level of protocols to ensure your data was protected? So if you're talking to anybody, make sure they're SOC 2 certified. That should be a part, a you know, core part of the, the diligence process. And the other part will be, you want to get that report on an annual basis to make sure that the partner you're working with has is, is got all those controls to protect your data. And what you're effectively doing in a lot of ways as a wealth management firm, you're, you're really outsourcing that risk because the, the expense and the capital to be SOC 2 certified is highly intensive. And, um, you know, this we joke a lot in our firm, but this is not like where you could start this business out of your garage. Um, you know, this is a business <laughs> where you look at the, the, the type of data that's being processed and the type of parties involved in these transactions. There's a ton of exposure. And so you've got to you've got to have the right controls and major investments in cybersecurity. Um, but I think those are the two regulatory focuses that we see all the time. It's Reg BI is a big part of it. And how do you help protect that and build in those controls in the process? And cybersecurity is another big part of it to make sure that you know, your data is protected. You've evidenced that you've done your diligence by selecting a provider. Um, and then, you know, that you can provide that report um, if to a regulatory body if, if they ever look for it. Very helpful. Switching over to a macro question. So, yes. so kind of a more of a macro environment related question. This is a big theme that I'm talking that I'm talking um, to as far as when I'm on the road, as I talk to folks when I'm in my home office. Um, you know, beyond being a custodian, it's it's good to understand what the thought processes are going on out there. Uh, there's a lot of forces at work, which I believe um, will will I think give us even a more intriguing platform as far as alternatives and the use of them going forward. But where do you see alternatives going in the next three to five years with rising inflation, with uh, with interest rates, you know, continuing to go up? Um, we have our ideas on it. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think there's a there's a report that was published by Prequent. And, you know, what they project when we look at, you know, alts and in private markets, you know, from 2021 to 2026, you know, the projection is you're going to see a, a growth, a net growth um, of 9.68 trillion. Um, so it is a, a, a massive, so it's, a, it's growing roughly from about 13 trillion to 23 trillion over five years. And, you know, so what we expect and what we see in the market is a massive growth uh, in, in alternative investments. And you can say, well, you know, where is that coming from? Why, why, what, what, what are the drivers behind that? And I, I think there's, it's kind of multifold, but part of it is, um, 
I think that there's a recognition from a wealth management advisor side in order to get the level of performance that you, you know, for your clients and advocate for your clients in their portfolio, that alternatives are a meaningful part of that portfolio. And so I think you're seeing more and more advisors incorporate them into the portfolio. There's a lot of chatter in terms of, hey, is the 60-40 portfolio shifting to a 50-30-20 portfolio? I think there's a lot of data and evidence to support that that is where the trend line is going at a portfolio level. And I think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that you have more advisors using and getting comfortable with all-term investments than ever before. I think it's, it's born out of the fact that they're looking for performance. They're looking to deliver for their client. You're also looking to differentiate and provide you know, that service. Say, hey, I'm, I'm looking out for you. I'm opportunistic. I'm finding these opportunities for you as my client. And there's also probably another element is, is alts become more and more common um, that if you're not providing access to alternatives for your client, then you're actually at a competitive disadvantage. And I think one of those other kind of macro trend lines is that when you look at what KKR and Blackstone and, um, and some other and Goldman Sachs and, and other large players uh, have done by entering the space, it's also created, I think, some brand credibility you know, to the overall industry, because these are the, the names that people are very comfortable with. They bring that brand. And when they enter, I think it creates an increased level of comfort. So what we expect in net is about, you know, 9.68 trillion in growth. What we see is more and more advisors using these products to advocate for, you know, for their client portfolios and performance. Um, and we see, you know, the entrance of the big names moving into this space. And frankly, if, if you flip it and, and go to the asset management side of it, I think this is also where the growth is. So, you know, I think the, the thesis we hear a lot in the market is that the institutional space is becoming saturated and that the growth opportunity for institutional asset managers is to move into the retail channel. So they're bringing capacity, they're bringing product supply into the retail channel because there's a growth opportunity there as an asset manager. And I think in the retail channel on the wealth management side, there's that opportunity to create a richer and more diversified portfolio for the client. And so I think those two forces together um, are actually you know, creating a high level of growth, which creates an, a really interesting and fun challenge, which is how do you scale it? So as we kind of open the conversation and the origin story in 2016, you know, it was really about, you know, paper and manual and everything was, was you know, layered, you know, mired in friction. Um, and then, you know, then we shift into this world today where it's seven years later, and now this becomes a scale conversation. So how does an industry support nearly $10, tr $10 trillion of growth and capacity over five years. You can't do that on paper. And so the way that needs to work is you've got to be able to have technology that does connect those things together so that you do in fact have better advisor experiences, higher levels of efficiency, enforce the regulatory and compliance practices in these transactions. And, and I think the net of it all will be, you know, people who, as you mentioned with your background, they know what a mutual fund experience looks like. If you've been in mutual funds and you've never done alts, a lot of people who are early entrants into go, oh my gosh, I can't believe this feels like the dark ages. And then when you then when you start to see the technology come into place, it starts to be, and frankly, what the expectation should be for the industry, and that's our reason for being is, alternative investment should feel like a mutual fund. They're not gonna be a mutual fund because they're subject to different regulations and that always is gonna be the core driver of all of it. But at a experiential parity level, there's no reason it can't begin to feel like a mutual fund. So the role we wanna play is to make the experience feel like a mutual fund. We want the advisors and wealth managers, you should get access to the product that you wanna get access to. You know, Pick your sponsor, pick your structure, be opportunistic, find the thing that is the best thing for your client portfolio and make sure that when you find it and locate it, that it's easier to do business. And on the flip side of it, if you're an asset manager, and you want to be able to access the retail market, you want to get access to all these RAs who want you know, want your product, then we want to help you know, build that connectivity and make it easier for you to raise capital and do business. And then when we look at our relationship um, with you, is we want to make it easier for you to process. Because again, we go back to this, certainly that brand element, there's a brand experience of we're, we're going to support a transaction that you are providing the custodial services we want that to be an airtight experience for you because we know it's a reflection on you. Um, and we also think that we can take those frictional points out. So 
there's less manual, you know, reconciliation in the back. There's fewer nigas you're having to process. Let's get it right the first time. And, and ultimately, this is a game of, of scale and growth, higher levels of efficiency, and de-risking everybody involved in the transaction. And then it becomes meritocracy, you know, because then you can let people choose the right product, the right relationship, the right partnership, and then just take out those frictional points that I think have, uh, have been in the industry for a long time, but don't, don't need to be there any longer. Thank you. That, and that leads into the final question. Um, and because we have one minute, we have, a, uh, we have a minute and a half left. Thank you for your time today. This has been great. I think we could do this for another couple hours. There's so much content and things to discuss. Um, as you travel, good, good way to kind of end is you, is for you to highlight AIX. And you've done it so well. Um, wh as you represent AIX across the country, going to conferences, meeting with RAs, et cetera, and broker dealers, what's some of the best feedback you've gotten regarding your platform and your services? I'll kind of hit it for the two, two quick lenses. I think the greatest compliment we can get on the wealth management side, I'll use broker dealer as an example, is they will use our technology as the differentiator to grow their business. So they know if they, if they have reps and advisors who want it to do alternative investment business and they see what we're doing with them as we kind of talk to them on those enterprise models, we're basically powering their, 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 their experience. So it's, it's their brand identity, their forms, their data, their workflows. It's simply powered by us, but when they show those reps what they can do and how easy it is to transact and do business uh, in alternatives, you know that is a recruiting vehicle where they're growing their independent broker dealer business because of 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 our technology. And so that that is something we take a lot of pride in because we're trying to do all the other things and de-risking efficiency and on. But if you can help someone grow their business and create a level of differentiation where you know, you, you can have people moving practices to be a part of that firm because your technology is making it so much easier. That's a great compliment. And then the last thing is, you know, when we think about um, our sponsor partners, we certainly want to be able to scale their business. So when we think about the investor relations group, they'll say the only reason, you know, in way we could raise the, 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 the volume and, and capital we're raising with the team we have is because of AIX. It's a huge scale play. And if they think about their counterparts as wholesalers, so the, some of the feedback we received is that, you know, we've opened up a whole new market for them. You know, as we talk mm -hmm. about RA in particular, um, is that the ability to make it easier to do business is making it easier for those wholesalers to go raise capital. So the greatest compliment I think we can ever receive is that we've opened up new market and distribution opportunities um, for the wholesaling teams of sponsors and their investor relations groups will, will testify that we've helped them scale their business and that they've been able to do that on the back of the technology because uh, it's you know too difficult and challenging to you know, keep hiring and building out teams and do that at the speed in which this industry is growing. Great, great, great way to end. Great way to summarize. Uh, thank you for your partnership. It's great to see you. Uh, happy holidays, you and your family. And um, again, thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing you on the road in a couple of weeks and all it, next year. It, it's, it's our pleasure and uh, you're fantastic. and the epitome of, of professional class. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And we love working with uh, you and your team at New View. And, and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of uh, this educational series. So thank you and happy holidays. Best to you and your family. Yeah, we, we really appreciate you and NAIX and, and uh, everything you bring to the table. Uh, to our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for the, to those who have committed to our series over the last, uh, gosh, four, five, six weeks, actually, not even a few weeks. And right now we're actually uh, building out our first and second quarter webinar series. We hope it's helpful. We hope it helps you and your, your businesses. And we wish everyone happy holidays, be safe, and happy new year. And have a great day.